Howdy, my name is Callum, also known as Northern Dice, and today I'm going to be giving you my full review of Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game by Steamforged Games. This is a game set in the Horizon Zero Dawn universe and has players working competitively or cooperatively to take on a hunt progressively, working towards a final hunt of taking down a sawtooth. It's an action point come miniatures, free movement game has got a lot of variability and a lot of meat on the bones. This copy was sent to us by Steamforged for and by its review. All of our opinions are our own and we aren't being paid for any media being produced. So here we've got Horizon Zero Dawn at its base set up for a two player game. Players have got their cards set up with their character, starting equipment leveling card, upgrade cards and their deck at hand. We have got the tiles in the middle ready for the tracking deck to be initiated. We've got the tracking deck ready, set out into the different phases with the actual hunter's call set up at the end. We've got the market cards in the top right hand corner out of the way because they're not needed until the market phase. We've got the dice available to players, we've got an assortment of tokens, two of each smaller model, because in a two player game you'll only ever encounter two of each smaller. In a four player game you'd want up to four, and only one of each larger model, and again in a four player game you'd want two of each larger model. We've got the assortment of tokens in their different flavours based on what they are, including damage, status effects, point tokens, honour tokens, trap tokens, and um, tear tokens for the actual enemy cards. We've got the enemy behaviour cards, and we've also got the enemy actual stats and factors, including tear, parts, etc. On top of that, we've also got the scrap cards and the stamina cards ready for players. This is not a how to play, this is simply a brief overview of what you do in a play. If you are looking for a how to play or a playthrough, I have got a playthrough video that I will put a link in the description and on the video right now. But we have got this just set up so I can give you a brief overview of what an actual game entails and how the game is played. The game itself always runs over several phases and these phases always run in the same sequence. You start with the tracking phase, go to the encounter phase, you have the campfire phase and then afterwards if you have completely succeeded you would move on to the next tracking phase which would be the next hunt. The tracking phase is more of a setup phase and during this phase the person with the most points will choose three tracking cards and choose one to take as their hunt and the lowest scoring player, the fledgling, will choose three event cards and then choose one of those that will be a bonus to them throughout that round. Now that's only in competitive. In cooperative it would be just that you would, between you, pick three tracking cards and place them out and you would only be playing for the victory overall. That is the style that we have played mostly. We don't mind the competitive. It does feel quite odd when you learn how you can lose in this game. The encounter phase is where you have the actual turn order being played by players. So the hunters activate one at a time and they can take several actions and then enemies activate. And enemies have two styles of activation. They can activate as a standard where they're not alert, they are just going about their business and the purple tracking lines are the routes that they will take. Alternatively, they have the alert phase, uh, the alert activation, which is where enemies that do know of the hunter's presence will activate before the non-alert enemies and do what they need to do. That will be dependent on what their cards dictate on their behaviours and some enemies also have little gimmicks or attributes that also become quite problematic on their information cards. The maintenance step is where that hunter will check to see if the hunting party has reached as many feints as there are hunters to establish if it is a game over. They'll also check to see if they have achieved the minimum number of points to succeed in this hunt, identified in the top right hand corner of the tracking card. If they've done this and there are still enemies about, they are welcome to continue hunting, but if they've not done this they will just continue on to the next player's turn. But of course, if they do get to this point and establish that the hunt cannot be completed because enemies have fleed, left the area, or other things have happened that have prevented them from getting the necessary points, that would also be a hunt fail and a game over. Once all hunters have activated and the routine has been run, and hunters have established if they have won, lost, or anything in between, they would move to the campfire phase. And at this point they'd have the victory step, which is where they'd establish how many glory points they have earned and earn sun tokens as according. They'd also get rid of their glory points. Glory points only act as any sort of value in a hunt. Afterwards you would get the sun tokens. Then hunters can level up. If they've taken on a hunt that is greater than their level, they will level up, which is done through the leveling up card. All hunters start on level 0, yellow tracking cards are level 1, orange tracking cards are level 2, and red tracking cards are level 3. Which ones you go for will always be determined by the lead player who is the one with the most points. 
Afterwards, you would go to the merchant step and players would be able to purchase cards from the level that they are currently at. Cards are laid out in terms of one weapon, one armor, two mods, two ammunition and one miscellaneous and can be purchased by players in turn order. These cards are replaced as soon as they are drawn. And once all players have passed on the purchase, they or one type of card has run out, the next tracking phase would begin and a new hunt would also begin. The only exception to this is during the final hunt, once four tracking cards have been placed, you are onto the hunter's call, which is where you would have no choice but to take on the sawtooth in this scenario and take on what is there. In terms of map layout, as you can see right here, we have got the card laid ready for players to look at. We have got the tiles in the correct orientations with the large symbol 6A, 4A and 2A in the appropriate spots for the tiles. The 4A tile with the large circle on dictates that that is the starting tile for players, so that's where they must appear. After that, you've got the bottom left-hand symbols, which tell you which enemies correlate to which letters. So in example here, we've got watchers on A's, and we have got striders on B's. You've also got squares and triangles, which sounds like a lot of symbols, but that simply says on the map that if there is a square, place a specific tile in the sense of these. And these come in two flavours. You can have rocks which are obstacles, and you can have ruins, which actually prevent damage for one turn if you are attacked whilst in a ruin. Finally, on the map you have also got long grass, and if enemies aren't currently alert to your location and you are in long grass, they cannot detect you for being in an adjacent spot, with the exception of some enemies because of the parts that they have and the abilities that they have innately. During a player's turn, they would play cards from their hand in order to perform actions, or would take actions that do not require cards. And these would take the form of things like sneaking, sprinting, distracting, which is effectively where they would throw a rock to distract one of the enemies on the map to move them forcefully, or crafting, which is where they would be able to take cards from their discard and put them back into their deck. Characters do not have health. All health is tracked for the number of cards that they have, and if at any point they cannot draw cards, they are exhausted and faint, and at that point then it would count as a single player losing. In any game, you are allowed to faint as many times as there are hunters, and when a hunter is brought back up, they would regain all of their stamina as in all their cards. Now, these cards come in three different flavours. You have ammo cards, which would be associated to ranged weapons. You have physical attacks, which would be for your actual melee weapon, but melee weapons do not always require a card to be played with them. And you have abilities, which can be played on conditional effects. An example of follow-up, which can be played after you can uh, inflict a condition on an enemy. Or hit and run. After resolving an attack, this hunter may perform a free sprint action. Now, certain actions do certain things on the map as well. So, in example, sprints would alert lots of enemies around you, whereas sneaking would not alert any and would allow the hunter to move quite quietly. So if we were to take an example turn with the Karja Hunter, the Karja Warrior, we would be wanting to try and focus on her strengths, because all of the actual enemy uh, hunters have specific strengths. The Karja Warrior really, really succeeds when it comes to inflicting any level of ice damage, but also being able to follow up with strong attacks as well. And if we were to take an example turn for this character, we would be able to move if we wished, move into grass if we wanted to, or we could just go straight in for hits. Now these cards are identified by these little symbols, and of course the dice is the dice that you would roll as a damage on top of any extra dice that you would gain from a card. So just as an example for this one, we are going to play a freeze bomb using our sling. So that will get placed into our discard, which means that we have already become slightly hurt, if you will. But in reality, all we have done is play a card so we're slightly tired. Now what we're going to do is we've got two range, and we're able to roll one orange for our sling and one black for our freeze bomb. The symbol in the bottom right hand corner is if on this black die we get a critical result and because we probably want to, we want to either choose to inflict one damage or inflict one condition. So I'll just roll these on here. I got two zeros. Now just for example's sake, let's say that we got a critical and a one. At that point, because this enemy is not alert, we are able to inflict one damage to them. So we can take a single damage token and attach it to them. We'd also, because we've got the critical, be able to add the ice status element to them. But also, because now we've struck this enemy, they become alert. And once they're alert, all of their attributes kick in, their special effects and also their armour. Which means that now we need to exceed a value of 1 to be able to do any damage to this enemy. But we still have a second action. 
and we probably aren't going to want to hang about and wait for this enemy to do something really crazy to us. So we are going to use follow-up, which says, after, play after this hunter inflicts a condition with an attack to move into the same square as the target and perform a free melee attack. If this attack kills, this hunter gains one additional glory point. So we're going to do that. We are going to be able to move straight into his square. And we need to be considerate of the fact that he has got a status element to him. He is currently frozen. Enemies that are frozen do not gain any armor bonuses. So at the minute he is at zero, which is massively helpful for us, particularly when we know that with our card Jahalberg, we're able to roll an orange and a blue, which is the more powerful dice. So we get the orange and the blue, we roll it, we get a critical and a one, and our critical allows us to move three away. So we could actually use this to try and escape. So we're going to do one damage to him. The status element disappears. And then we'd be able to move one, two, three. And at that point, our turn would be finished and we would then we need to resolve what the Watcher would do using the Watcher's behavior card. And the Watcher's behavior card runs on a very, very simple basis. It simply says, does a non-alert enemy start within two squares of the Watcher? And the answer is yes, because if we look, we've got one, two. So at that point, we move one towards the non-alert enemy he moves to there. Enemies that are within one of an alert enemy also become alert. But enemies that are alerted this way do not activate, so that's a bit of convenience for us. And then afterwards we would move any enemies that are not alert, an example of the strider in this top corner. So different status elements do different things to enemies, and they can also do negative things to players as well, so they're worth being vigilant of. But the run would be very simple in terms of how it would run. We would do this until the enemy has got zero health, take him off the board, earn scrap, earn glory, run it until we have exceeded the necessary two victory points, glory points that we would need, with the striders being worth one and the watchers being worth one each, and then we would take another tracking phase. In competitive, the lead player with the most points would take the tracking phase and the fledgling player would take the event phase. Now what's really important to note is that enemies all behave differently dependent on what they are. In the example of the Watcher, his entire gimmick is that he will run around trying to alert other enemies and make your life as problematic as quickly as possible. The Grazial, on the other hand, will attack you if you are within one square. But if you are not within one square, it will head towards the edge of the map, and once it gets there on its next turn, it will leave the map and you will no longer be able to hunt that enemy or gain glory points. The Shell Walker and the Sawtooth have lots and lots of armor, lots and lots of attack, but also lots and lots of behaviors. Because they are such large machines with such diverse components, they are able to do a lot more to you. There is also the consideration for the fact that these enemies are made up of lots of parts, and because of that, enemies like the Shell Walker and the Grazer have actual parts that you can break off. And if on your turn you were to choose to try and break a part off, you could do so, gain some scrap, but also make life easier for you and your fellow hunters in terms of reducing the amount that they can do. In the example, if you were to take out the Rotor Blades, the Grazer would no longer be able to use the Rotor Blades attack meaning that you are able to get a free kill. On the flip side, if you wanted to just do a little bit of damage or give it an attribute of fire, you could attack the blaze canisters and just blow those off of its back. The shell walker on the flip side may have other elements that you can break off in order to do extra damage to prevent certain attacks from happening or to even just slow it down. Like in the video game, as enemies become more damaged, they become more sluggish, more slow and easier to take out. But with that, it's also worth being aware that they are still incredibly quick and incredibly dangerous, even in the board game counterpart. The biggest concern for that is that you need to be aware of whether it's competitive or cooperative. In competitive, you will only earn honour points and glory points if you are the one to get the kill. If you are weakening an enemy just for someone else to steal that kill, you are then going to be putting yourself in a position where you have done work for no glory. On the flip side, if it's cooperative, it is all about distributing the responsibility and ensuring that people are pulling their weight. With that as well, being able to draw the enemy's attention away by either being closer or being aware of the enemy's behaviours to know which uh, hunter they're going to target at which time. Some enemies also have follow-up attacks and they also have conditions on these cards. Grey, blacked out parts are always played through, blue parts are always conditional and will always be dependent on either parts being present 
or certain circumstances being met. Expansions to the core game do exist in example of the Thunderjaw expansion, which come with not only new models in the example of this absolutely monumental behemoth on the board, but they also come with new boards, and alongside that you may get new weapons, new hunts, but also new condition cards, including new behaviours and new parts. The Thunderjaw itself, before we even get started, has 50 health as a standard, and is an absolute behemoth on the map. He comes with a four-tile fold-out board, and he is terrifying. This is a hunt that would be more of a long hunt, and does come with its own expansion campaign, but still requires the core game to play. Not a review of this, but just giving you a flavour of the actual wealth and variety available inside of this, beyond the core game. Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, doesn't try to replicate the actual video game itself. The video game follows Aloy on a grand adventure to save the world like any other AAA open world game. This takes the world of Horizon Zero Dawn and takes the actual culture, the tribes, the actual things that they do for hunts and takes that and puts it into a board game. And that it does exceptionally well. The core principle is that you are junior hunters and you want to prove yourself as decent hunters. You want to go out there and prove that you are worthy of protecting your different tribes. And of course in the video game lots of tribes gather together to do this, almost Hunger Games style but without the lack of food. And with that players need to take on that mantle and really drive home that they are wanting to outcompete the other players to show that not only are they the better hunter, but more worthy of protecting the tribes themselves. Each tribe has a sort of gimmick, a strength that they will play into, and each enemy is very unique in what it does and how players will need to tackle it. Competitive or cooperative, you're going to be constantly needing to be vigilant of both what everyone is doing at any one time and what the enemies are going to do on their turn as well. As far as an immersive board game goes, that gives you a bit of an outside view of how an internal world works. I think it does exceptionally well. It's not a game that you will immediately think, I am Karja, I need to be winning, I need to protect the honour of the Osaram, but it is one that you will enjoy pretending to be within. It's not quite role-playing as you'd expect it to be, but it is one where you will feel the vibe of the game and the theme is done exceptionally well and well enough for it to stick and be needed. Kicking off with gameplay, it's incredibly immersive and you will be constantly on your toes about what everyone's doing. As I've said, it's not so immersive that you immediately become part of a tribe and you feel like you've got to know the background, the law, the actual values of that tribe, but you'll know that you've got certain strengths and certain weaknesses and that you can play into those and avoid the others to make sure that you've got the best chance of getting killing blows or being able to, successful, uh, to be successful in the hunt as a whole. Um, as far as the actual diversity goes across the game, I think there's plenty enough just in the core. You get four different types of hunters, two of which are very heavy on the melee, two of which are very heavy on the um, ranged combat. But even so, as you go through the market, you're able to diversify, upgrade, change, and if you want, you could take this Karja Hunter, who is very much about adding status effects and doing melee damage and change her up entirely into someone who is a hunter with a bow. There's nothing to stop that from happening and you'd also gain the benefits of her upgrades and abilities. And because each hunter feels unique enough in themselves that you get a good variety across it, it's also worth mentioning that their upgrades inside on what they can do in terms of how they will develop is also very diverse. Again, with this Karja Hunter, I'm going to stick to the Karja Hunter a lot, I love the Karja Hunter. She can focus more on that melee side and doing lots of heavy hits, big damage, eventually getting the Lightbringer, which is a massive, massively damaging melee weapon. Or alternatively, you can go down the alternative route of the keeping your distance, adding status effects, and being able to be more of a supporting element. Now, dependent on your group, dependent on the hunters, and dependent on how everyone's playing, it'll determine how you are going to choose that path. And it's worth mentioning that you will have that impact. You cannot go in this as four completely separate entities trying to just hit one thing as hard as you can. This is a game that requires planning, communication, and a lot of strategy. I've never played a game that isn't cooperative in its heart that has required so much communication and diplomacy. You need to make sure that everyone is aware that if you've set a trap, we could lure it over here, knowing full well that that isn't to your benefit. 
Knowing that you might freeze the enemy, which again is not going to be to your benefit, or even something as crazy as getting in the hell massive, massive hits to try and get it as low health as possible so someone else can take the kill, just so you can get onto the next hunt itself. I don't enjoy this game co uh, competitively though. I feel like the competitive mode just doesn't fit well with who I've played with. That doesn't mean that it's not of good quality, it's really enjoyable, and you can really get on with it, but you need to be that right group. I didn't quite enjoy the whole let's communicate as long as we can and then I'm going to not backstab you but I'm going to get the other upper hand I'm going to underhandedly steal this kill because you still had to go with that hunter or those hunters into the next hunt and you know full well that you have then lost favour with them. I'm not intentionally using tribal puns or you know that sort of value-esque but it does just sort of fit into the communication and language used around this game. You will lose favour with people if you steal their kills. And even though you may get out of this alive and be the top hunter, they are not going to be best friends with you after this because you have stolen the kill on the Shellwalker after everyone has just contributed so heavily to killing it. And I guess for some groups that'll work amazingly. Those people who like those games where you are semi-cooperative as a pure basis. Like Nemesis's example was my first thought. You are throughout that entire game trying to get out but you've also got some secret objectives this is less about the secret objectives this is more about you've put your hands on the car uh, you put your hands you put your hand on the table and you have said i want to be the best hunter so if i can get the best kill i will get the best kill and everyone else is in the exact same position it works exceptionally well at ensuring that you communicate even in that competitive sense but for me i think it's the cooperative side that shines being able to really talk deploy um uh, get some diplomacy going, really discuss how you can address things, how you can approach things, who gets what responsibility. And the way we've avoided quarterbacking and people taking over and being, oh, why don't you, is by just making sure our hands are hidden. We ran it on that mentality that the hunters wouldn't be able to shout across from each other, across the map to each other and say, oh, I've got a card, oh, I can, because the enemies are going to hear them. So we ran it on a basis so of we communicated or we talked, we said what we could do, but at no point did we ever show our hands and say, here are the cards, what should I do, you tell me. Because it then made it still a very independent experience and it also made it for those real maverick moments which are always incredibly magical in this game. Because if you've got someone who wants to be the renegade and they go off and do something either beautifully stupid or just stupidly stupid, it's something you're going to remember. And it's something that you're going to smile about later. If not, be kicking yourselves because they did something so daft you had to go and save them. But I imagine it is like that if this was a real-life scenario. You are young hunters, you are wanting to prove your mettle, so you are wanting to do the more dynamic thing, even if it does cost you a life. I think it's superb in that immersion, that gameplay, that theme, and how it presents itself and gives you those tools. And I think it is something that, because of that, I'm going to keep coming back to. I've already spoken no end about player interaction, but I think it's just worth mentioning again that it is the actual cornerstone of the game. Even when I've played this solo with two hunters, I have still felt the need to consider what each player could do, how they could work, what's going to be best to really cash in on this Nora Marksman over this Karja Warrior. Thinking if I keep her as far back as possible and keep her hidden in this corner, I could use my Karja to drag everyone else out, get some status effects down, and she can snipe them from afar. Now, in a different scenario with two players, that communication may still happen, but keeping those cards hidden to your chest as if it was competitive, playing it cooperative, you're still going to need that discussion of how can you help me address this problem? Because if I die, we all die. And with that, it really drives home the actual weight of how much each player contributes and needs to contribute, because that communication just needs to be there. I'm only going to keep this bit short, but it is such a staple part of this game. Communication and discussion is just Horizon Zero and Dawn, the board game, in a nutshell. Arguing about how you're going to take out big tin monsters, the game. And now I get to talk about my favourite thing because I'm an incredibly shallow gamer, the artwork and the component quality. Before I even get anywhere, if you've watched any of my previous videos or any of my videos ever, you will know that I'm incredibly shallow. I like things to look pretty. I like things to be very tactile. I like it to look good. And my days, does this game look good? I've said it once and I'll say it again. Steamforged knew how to make a model. They knew how to make a 3D model, print it and just make it stunning. This is just a little crab fella that's made out of plastic. 
he's got a big arm, but the detail within that is just insane. Looking at his arm, you can see all of the different joints, all of the plates connected. It is a painter's dream. And that's one of the large models. Even if I were to take the smallest model from the game, the Watcher, you've still got all that wiring going through the neck, you've got the lens at the front, the different panels going through it, and it's very reflective of the video game counterpart. All of the actual artwork and video game elements are in this, and they have to be, because this is based on that IP, and it's done exceptionally well. There isn't a single part of this game that doesn't make me think it has almost been taken, not with an influence of the video game, but with the actual heart of the theme, tone, styling of the video game. The only downside I can think to this is that these aren't painted, and that's to my detriment because I do not want to put paint on them. Some of the models are a bit smaller, like in example the Hunters, and because of that they can feel a little bit more flimsy in terms of like this bow. I always worry that if I pick it up by that, or if someone does, I'm being a bit delicate, it may snap. But even so, the level of quality on these hunters, you can see the facial expressions, you can see all the accessories, the threading on their clothes. I mean, you can see where the seams are on the actual armour. It's insane. Artwork is very much what you'd expect. It's based on the video game, but these aren't renders, these are re-illustrations, which I like. I'm not a fan of photos. I always love it when it's artwork. The symbolism of everything is very, very straightforward. I did find the boards a little bit confusing to start off with because you look at a board and you're overwhelmed with A's, B's, triangles, squares, purple lines, but then you've got the lovely artwork on the back. Now, I know that some people will look at this and think, my goodness, it's just another dry, barren land. It looks very post-apocalyptic. A majority of the video game does take part in a Sahara-esque, dusty, I don't know, you must imagine it's been Nevada with nothing but shrubs and just little patches of grass. The flip side to that is that the expansions do include new tiles with new terrain types, but if that's what you're going for alone, probably not worth what you're going to be paying just for tiles. The expansions do include a lot more, but I'll talk about those in a bit. As for the actual tiles themselves, they're all very, very straightforward, nice chunker, they all fit exactly where they need to fit. These didn't. Uh, these came in punch boards, they punched out really well. All of the tokens, really chunky. Even the sun tokens, as you're looking at them, you can tell the difference between the full sun, the half sun, the blazing sun. All of the other elements as well make sense. The only confusing element, again, with those tokens is that they all have symbols on them, and if you are brand new to the game, it can be quite overwhelming that you've got A's, B's, C's and D's, tear tokens, damage tokens, double-sided tokens. It all fits together and works within what it needs to work in, but it is always worth just thinking, if you are going to pick up this game, check the rules, understand what things do, make sure you know before you start panicking. There are a lot of symbols in this game, and it's not worth panicking over a single one when the rulebook does a really good job, and I know Steamforged have got some videos out explaining a lot of this as well. So where does replayability come in all this? Well, you have got Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, which does just feature a single style hunt. You've got the Hunter's Call at the end where you are trying to take on the big nasty Sawtooth. You are trying to prove that you are a worthy hunter by taking out this big behemoth. And that is it. But that's not where the replayability stops. That may be your target for the core game, but inside of that, you have got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 different tracking cards to run through, all of which you won't experience in a single game. You've got four different hunters, all who are incredibly unique in the way they play, but also within that you've got the levelling system within to actually diversify what they do. You have the different scenarios where you have the events that will happen inside of it from the fledgling and the leader tokens which are in the competitive style, but also the market decks. Now I haven't talked too much about the market deck and I didn't cover it too much in my actual quick how the overview of the game runs and there's a reason for that. It's because it's quite... It's... It takes a while to get the market set up because you need two of one, one of one, one of one. It's, it's a lot. But rather than do that, I'd rather just have a look at a few cards and just say what they do. Because being able to acquire the hard point arrows for the Nora Marksman is going to give you a very different outcome to getting the firebomb for the Karja Warrior. Because they do different things and it changes how you will play. 
Not only do you have the leveling system, you have the markets to compete with to actually identify how you're going to be strategized. If you've got the Osiram, who is incredibly heavy armor, doesn't always need to move, massively big hits, you're going to want to be stacking them with more armor. But that's not always the play. Sometimes you can go down the route of, they've got incredibly heavy armor, I'm going to remove that, I'm going to make them a really, really fast-moving glass cannon. Have them diving across the board, really hitting hard. And it's that diversifying that of that gameplay that you have got full control of. You've also got the actual scrap cards, which I didn't go into so much detail about either, but they aren't just pieces of scrap and components to purchase elements of this in. You've also got different outcomes. You may get cards that say earn extra glory. You may have cards saying um, a, mon uh, a monster, a robot comes back to life, it reactivates. All of this stuff changes how the game plays. And without even opening the Thunderjaw expansion, I have had more mileage out of this core game than I have a lot of other larger games with modules. And that's not me just trying to say I have played this non-stop. That is me saying the experience I have had in this game have been far more unique than in a lot of larger, more modular games. And that's simply because of how you have got so much control over what happens in game. You choose to move, you choose to attack, you choose to run, you choose to hide. It's all going to change the actual outcomes of what happens next with each hunt, with each hunter's turn, with each enemy activation. The only downside to that is that if it's game over, it's game over. Which I have always found a little bit harsh, and for us when we play, we always play it on a two-game over system. Almost like a continue. If you wipe, we always say that you can reset. You reset that one scenario, there's no market phase in between, but you can have another crack at it. The cards are always going to be different, the outcomes will always be different, and you can't guarantee that you'll get to the exact same point, reset, almost quick save, and try it a different route. Because the actual chaos of the deck shuffle and the chaos of the dice roll will always influence that. And I think that's another way the game does manage to get a bit more variability in. And I know people don't like combat with dice. I'm not the biggest fan. But I think the fact that these are quite balanced works because you've got your orange dice, which has got a blank, a crit, a double hit, and three single hits. And then you've got the blue dice, which has got three doubles, two singles, and a triple hit. And then, of course, the black dice, which has just three crits. But I think it works, and I think it does well to balance itself out just through these little elements and also the larger overarching mechanics that make it quite a, a varied and different experience every time. Just a quick word about expansions. This is not a review of the Thunderjaw expansion, and it's not a recommendation to purchase expansions. It's just my quick brief on the expansions for Horizons who are done the board game. The Thunderjaw expansion has given me a fair bit of mileage as well. It gives you lots of new hunts using the core game's elements. It also gives you the Thunderjaw model, which is almost like a big boss at the end. With that, it does have new elements, new mechanics, new bits, and that's just one expansion. This expansion only comes with one large model. I mean, massive. He's not a miniature. He's a mega. He is monumentally big. But... Other expansions do come with more models, which will then vary the gameplay even further. And there's nothing to stop you from actually integrating several expansions into one, exchanging when it says Watchers, really spicing it up, and instead throwing the snap moles, the big metal crocodiles in there, and really just diversifying the gameplay of your own accord. But on that warning, these are done relatively balanced, and even the Thunderjaw ones, as brutal as it is, I will say, the hunts are very balanced, the Thunderjaw... Is relatively balanced, I'm still yet to beat him. If you are adding new elements of your own choice and homebrewing elements in this, wonderful, keep it varied, keep it fantastically dynamic, but be warned, they aren't going to be balanced and you will be very, very outnumbered very, very quickly. I like the expansions, I think even just that one was worth it alone. Further to that, adding more will make it more worth it, but it depends on how deep you want to go into the Horizon Zero Dawn the board game rabbit hole. I've got a lot of mileage out of just the core game, I know that I'll get a lot more mileage out of it because of that, but it doesn't mean I wouldn't still have enjoyed just the core game alone. Okay, final thoughts. I think this is a superb game. I really enjoy it. I found it very immersive. I found it very true to the video game without being the video game in terms of its theme, its nuances, the actual idea of what you're doing. The models, stunning. The artwork, fantastic. The mechanics, they all work incredibly well. 
the phases do work. It can be a little bit of a slog to get the routines and knowing what all the symbols do, but once you've got that, I found it incredibly fun. There is also a real tact to it in knowing how to approach the game because it's player, enemies, player, enemies, player, enemies. And if you aren't aware of that, if you go in, alert all enemies, and they attack that bloke, he's not going to be best happy. There's a lot to learn, and there's a bit of a steep learning curve in that first game, but I think it's so worth checking out. So would I recommend this? The absolute answer is yes, just on the basis of how much fun I have had with it. If I were to recommend it to anybody, it would be those people who, of course, are a fan of Horizon Zero Dawn the board game. It's an obvious one. But also people who are quite fan of any games that are miniature-based or even ones that give them a lot of choice. This game does not hold your hand and it does not restrain you in what you must do or can do. If you want to have an Osaram warrior with no armour running across that battlefield, really focusing on those big hits, you can and there's nothing to stop you. As you get towards level 3, it becomes easier to really build that build using the market cards and the upgrades. Even the... Um, modules that you can add into your weapons to change them as well they become quite key in terms of building your build who would i not recommend this game for anybody who does not like miniatures goes without saying but people who do not like that competitive element as i've said we play this primarily cooperatively and we love it we're not the biggest fans of the competitive mode but if you are going in for this and you do not like competitive whatsoever get it and get the cooperative but on the flip side, if you are wanting one where you are not cooperative whatsoever, this is not for you. This is one that requires some level of cooperation, some level of communication, some level of discussion. And because of that, I wouldn't recommend it for anybody who is on the big war game 1v1, 2v2 sort of defense of board gaming. I've talked for more than long enough. I have loved checking out Steamforged Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, and I would highly recommend it to anybody who is a fan of miniatures games, games with large, chunky components, lots of artwork, or anybody who is looking for a game that gives them lots of choice and that real hunter feel. Thank you ever so much for sticking around for so long. I will catch you next time.